Okay, so we're now recording. Okay, um, Fleischman? Here. Shining? Here. Byro? And you? Here. Okay, so I'm gonna open it up for public comment. <coughs> I see we have about 15 attendees. If you want to make public comment, all right, I see a hand raised. Jenny Harrison. Go ahead. Okay. Julia? Jenny, you, so you're unmuted. You, there you go. Hi. Um, this is Jeannie Harrison. Thank you very much. Um, and I just want to give you a little bit of information about me. Um, my firm is the Jeannie Harrison Law Firm in Los Angeles, downtown. I'm going on 28 years of doing plaintiff's employment litigation. I handle cases all the way from pre-litigation through trial. Um, and I uh, can fairly be said to be a subject matter expert on uh, employment cases. Uh, I've testified at Capitol Hill in Sacramento as part of the Me Too hearings, um, legal services uh, organizations seek my counsel and expertise on policy issues, research, uh, and that kind of thing. I do a tremendous amount of teaching of lawyers uh, as well um, about uh, substantive employment law and also trial work. Um, and what I can say is I also handle, you know, every kind of case from small to big, none of which uh, lack complexity because employment law is a complex area of the law involving overlapping federal and state law, um, substantive law, uh, and then regulations, there are constitutional issues. Many of my cases uh, also have 1983 claims and the like, Title VII and the EEOC, uh, laws and regulations, best practices um, uh, are constantly involved as well as California, obviously statute, case law, regulations, the CCR is constantly changing case law. Um, and what we do is, by and large, m most of these cases involve uh, using circumstantial evidence to prove intent. That is not something that can be reduced to the lowest common denominator from the perspective of um, paraprofessional work. Um, exhaustion of remedies is a subject matter in which, um, even in pre-litigation, obviously it is pre-litigation, uh, exhausting the administrative remedies is rife with um, errors by trained lawyers and constantly leads to malpractice actions, um, even for trained lawyers. Uh, so I, I certainly don't think that this is an area that can simply be handed over to paraprofessionals. In fact, paralegals have worked for me at my law firms um, for the past 27 years. Uh, there are sort of constant mistakes that we have to catch in the drafting of certain documents. They are never, never, never um, uh, vested with the authority to do content work um, in my firm and in most of the top firms of which I'm aware. Um, and uh, when, by content work, I mean interviewing clients who uh, all the way from the beginning of that, interviewing clients um, when they're being signed up, um, many of whom are in the process of the free fall of their trauma and are extremely um, harmed and traumatized. Uh, there, I've had clients who are suicidal. They are very complex emotional statuses that people are uh, experiencing. Um, and they take a tremendous amount of individualized, experienced counsel to be able to help people. Ms. And Harrison, if we, I'm, I'm going to ask you to, if you could kind of wrap up your comments, you're at about three minutes and 30 perfect. right now. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and so um, my concern is that if we uh, consider handing over these complex areas to paraprofessionals, this is not going to enhance access to justice. It will instead be access to injustice 
and the harm that can be uh, that can occur to working people will be significant. I look forward to listening to your deliberations and participating, hopefully being able to contribute in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? I don't see any other hands raised. There are a couple of people on the phone. Oh, Laura. Laura Horton. Go ahead. You're, you're muted still. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. My name is Laura Horton. I'm principal of the Horton Law Firm. Like Jeannie Harris, I've been practicing close to 30 years practicing predominantly in employment plaintiff work. Um, during my practice, I have seen uh, several cases that have come to me that have been handled by either a personal injury lawyer or a lawyer that does not have expertise in employment cases. And by the time the cases get to me, they're so screwed up that there's no way that I can possibly touch them. And that is a barrier to justice. I think that turning over these types of cases to paraprofessionals is a recipe for disaster. You know, people call me every day and they say, I have a wrongful termination case. Well, a wrongful termination case comes in, in many flavors and overlapping, as Jeannie said, overlapping regulations, both state and federal, and just issue spotting some of these um, areas it is difficult even for someone like me who's been practicing for close to 30 years in this particular field and there is no way that a paraprofessional would have the ability to identify the appropriate issues in the appropriate statutes or causes of actions or legal theories that need to be alleged especially at the administrative exhaustion with respect to access to justice, there are many contingency lawyers out there who are willing to take on righteous cases. Those cases in which uh, a potential employee that's been terminated or harassed or whatever it is, also has a backup if they're unable to find a contingency lawyer. They can go directly to the Department of Fair Employment and Housing and ask for an investigation and file their complaint there similarly with the EEOC. So I, at, at least from the plaintiff's employment perspective, I don't see an issue where there is denial of justice or denial of access to remedies. Um, the other thing about employment law is it's a very sophisticated practice and the law is changing constantly. The um, Fair Employment and Housing Act, I think, is somewhere around 60 years old now. And really, in the life of jurisprudence, that isn't that long. Um, the, there's new case law that comes out of our California Supreme Court um, constantly. And interpreting that case law is very difficult. We, I belong, I'm on the board of the California Employment Lawyers Association, and we're very proactive in making webinars and our conferences to provide educational support to our members. Paraprofessionals, I don't think are going to have the capacity or the ability to understand and identify the changes in the law. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Cowan. Thank you. My name is Barbara Callen. I am also on the board of the California Employment Lawyers Association. I echo the concerns raised by Ms. Harrison and Ms. Horton. In addition, um, I would also note that in, for example, sexual harassment cases, one of the issues that we deal with a lot is the, is the testimony and evidence of other victims. This was present, obviously, in the Harvey Weinstein cases, in the cases regarding USA Gymnastics. And those are very public examples of cases where we, which we prosecute all the time. Um, and those issues are present in virtually every single sexual harassment case, given that 
usually it's not the perpetrator's first time. And there's a lot of perpetrators that continue to engage in that conduct throughout the course of their career. One of the items we must do is, is talk to other victims and survivors of that harassment and then pr uh, provide evidence to the court that complies with the evidence code regarding those kind of claims. That requires very sophisticated knowledge of the evidence code itself, of what is permitted, of uh, making sure that the testimony is proper and fair, both um, to the, the perpetrator as well as to our client, making sure that what we are putting forth is, uh, is correct and is something that can be considered. If evidence is put before the court that does not comply with the evidentiary guidelines, that evidence can be tossed out and ruled inadmissible. And if that occurs, there would be a survivor who's not able to, to seek justice solely because um, whoever was drafting the, the declarations providing the testimony didn't know how to comply with the evidence code. That's a very sophisticated um, uh, duty that we have that is not can, could not be given to a paraprofessional. We also have the duty of investigating claims. Um, when there's you know, multiple victims, we have to evaluate whether there's conflicts of interest. We have to um, look at the ever-changing laws, particularly right now, regarding sexual harassment and other types of harassment that occur in the workplace. There often is um, what we call intersectionality among those claims in that there is typically you know, a claim for sexual harassment may also involve racial harassment may also involve disability discrimination or age discrimination. And one has to be able to know and to definitely move across varying regu regulatory and statutory schemes to ensure that we are making all of the claims that our clients could possibly have. This is an incredibly complex area of the law. It is changing literally every single day through either statutes or regulations or appellate opinions. We as lawyers have continuing legal education requirements um, that are in addition to the vast requirements that are set upon us just to enter the profession, mm -hmm. whether it be law school, the bar exam, and our moral and character fitness applications. And this vetting process is what allows us to operate as fiduciaries to our clients and to the public in, in general. Um, and if I could ask you to, to wrap up your comments, it's been about three and a half minutes. Thank you. Yes, of course. Um, we as lawyers have a, have a fiduciary duty to our clients and it is not taken lightly, both with respect to the law and with respect to you know, our, our trust accounts and the like. These are all in play. And for that reason, um, I join my colleagues in urging that paraprofessionals not be permitted to engage in the practice of law. Okay, Mr. Katz, or Andy Katz, I'm sorry. Hello, good afternoon, committee members. I'm Andy Katz. I'm a member of the California Employment Lawyers Association and the Consumer Attorneys Association of California. Uh, I started my legal education at Santa Clara University where uh, I practiced at the Workers' Rights Clinic for a summer. And uh, that's what inspired me to do work uh, for low-wage workers. And I, I learned that while a subset of wage theft cases that I handled uh, were non-legal advocacy before a hearing examiner, the great majority of cases required that I learn under the direction of a supervising attorney, the complexity of misclassification and meal and rest period issues. Uh, similarly, for the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board, uh, where I handled workers' compensation cases at that clinic, uh, there were many complex issues that I was not able to understand as a non-lawyer, and I had to learn from a supervising attorney. There is no need, and it would be very harmful to deregulate practice of law in the way proposed. Non-lawyers may already appear uh, uh, pursuant to the re requirements of that agency before the Department of Labor Standards Enforcement and the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board. However, the best practices are under the direction of a supervising attorney, like a university clinic or a nonprofit service organization, 
many of which are funded by the state bar or cities and counties or the state of California or private foundations. Uh, for, furthermore, I think that uh, it, it is very dangerous to have uh, paraprofessionals without the licensure requirements, without the, uh, 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 the knowledge and skill requirements that are regulated by the state bar, providing general advice. There are a lot of complex rules to keep track of and to uh, stay on top of the research and evolving uh, legal trends. Uh, it, is, it is not appropriate to uh, treat low-wage workers in this way. There are other solutions, and I, I would urge the State Bar uh, to further work with uh, the, the, the people who actually do this work. It doesn't seem like our organizations have been really consulted about solutions. I've also done in my practice a lot of work for uh, low-wage workers who are impacted by health insurance denials, and there are reforms to the law that could make that more accessible. Uh, but this proposal doesn't do that. This proposal doesn't, doesn't look at uh, how can lawyers work together with health advocates? Uh, how can nonprofit organizations help? Deregulation doesn't solve the problem. It actually creates new ones. Um, I, I think it would be uh, good to talk about other solutions, but, but simply uh, deregulating the practice of law, I think would cause much more harm than good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Leonard Sansanowicz. Leonard? Um, I can't hear Leonard. Can others hear him? Can you? I can't hear him either. Okay, Leonard, we can't hear you. Um, I think we should, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, Let people who know who have called in but if you want to raise your hand via the phone, you can do so by dialing star nine. Okay, I do see another hand. So Leonard, um, we will come back and, and try you uh, if we're not, uh, after we hear from this next speaker, Renuka Jane. I think you need to, un yes, there you go. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Renuka Jain, and like Ms. Horton, Ms. Harrison, and Ms. Govin, I'm also a member of the California Employment Lawyers Association. I have been practicing law, employment law, since 1987, both in Texas, in Houston, actually, and since 2008 in California. Um, I think the desire of this committee and this group to provide access to justice is a laudable goal. Unfortunately, like many social programs, this is going to have an adverse impact on the very communities, the communities of color and those who are economically disadvantaged. Uh, and that impact, as my colleagues have referenced in great detail, is not going to enhance access to justice, but it's going to enhance access to a form of justice that denies people of color who are the most in need of help, proper and competent help. And that is not because the paraprofessionals will not endeavor to be competent, but because this area is incredibly complex there is numerous issues that arise that are very difficult to consider unless you are a trained professional. So I would urge this committee to investigate this issue further before adopting any proposal that seeks to deregulate the bar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Leonard, we can try you again. Are you able to speak? Let's see if that works. Yes, it does. Great. 
Go ahead. So it did work. You're now muted again. How's that? Better? Yes. Okay. Uh, like my colleagues, uh, Ms. Horton, Ms. Cowan, Ms. Jane, I too am on the executive board of the California Employment Lawyers Association. I join uh, the comments that have been made before by them and also by Ms. Harrison and Mr. Katz. Um, I'm looking online at the reason, stated reason by the State Bar for this program, uh, which is that research has found a, a lack of knowledge about what constitutes a legal issue and concerns about legal costs that lead many Californians to deal with problems on their own rather than seek legal help. Well, uh, the solution to a lack of knowledge is to provide education or to provide um, a direction to legal professionals, uh, that is lawyers. Um, and there are plenty of plaintiff side lawyers and everybody on our side works on contingency fee, at least everybody that I know about, which means there are no upfront costs for the, uh, for the plaintiffs. And if that even was a consideration that the bar did not want to endorse one attorney or, or group over another, there are plenty of uh, community-based organizations that are part of the, the, the state bar's justice gap fund, um, which are recognized as uh, advocates for employee rights. There are also uh, employees can be directed in the case of um, discrimination and harassment claims to the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, and in the case of wage and hour matters to the Division of Labor and Standards Enforcement or the Labor Commissioner's Office. So there are state agencies also staffed by attorneys who can handle these issues. Uh, it's a little ironic that the state bar, which, um, which administers the bar examination uh, for attorneys, uh, wants to send the practice of law to paraprofessionals. That devalues our um, uh, efforts that we have made, not only in attending law school for three or four years in some cases, but studying for the bar exam, passing the bar exam, and like my colleagues before me have said, uh, continuing to uh, educate ourselves through continuing legal education, which is a requirement for attorneys by the state bar, as are ethical and fiduciary duties. Um, and that brings me to my next point, which is on the same page that I'm looking at on the state bar website, it says a thoughtfully designed and appropriately regulated paraprofessionals program is an important component of the solution to the access to legal services crisis. I disagree that there is a crisis in California of an access to legal services. The, um, the study that was commissioned by the University of Chicago uh, was based on information that came from counties outside of California and one county, Santa Clara County, uh, within California, and it was uh, the numbers were inflated. So there, I disagree that there is a crisis, but even if there were, um, my question is, what is a thoughtfully designed and appropriately regulated program? What are the parameters of this regulation? Are these paraprofessionals going to be subjected to the same regulations that we as attorneys are through the rules of professional conduct? Uh, there's a, a huge dearth of information as to what this program will be uh, and how it will be implemented. It appears that it benefits uh, the very few and large corporations and large companies uh, and not the workers who it is supposed to be helping. And so we urge the state bar uh, not to implement this program. I thank you for my time. Thank you. Um, Phone number 323-677-0200. It sounds like they got disconnected. Maybe they will call back. Uh, but for right now, that is our last uh, public comment. Uh, Jennifer Ostertag. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Ostertag, and I've been an attorney for 21 years practicing in employment law. I'm with the Jimmy Harrison Law Firm. 
I echo my colleagues' comments. I mean, the employment law is a very complex area of the law. Most cases that I handle have a crossover between discrimination, sometimes civil rights, and um, wage and hour. Wage and hour is constantly evolving and having power professionals while i have you know work had paralegals uh, work for me throughout my career they are not able to recognize all the issues that um, a case may have or, or all the possible complaints that um, a plaintiff may have as to uh, having power professional also there's a concern that Beside the lack of training and the lack of continuing education and the standard that they would not be passing the bar exam, which at least required a minimum um, knowledge of the law and competency. Um, the other thing would be that they would not be having any malpractice. So when they essentially mishandle a case, there is no recourse for that plaintiff um, to, um, to go after that prior professional. Also, if it's access to justice, like my colleagues all said, we all work on contingencies. And if, and if um, the bar is really concerned that um, there are not enough contingency lawyers, there are great organizations, legal aid organizations like BedZedek, who are representing low income workers. And so the solution is not to have people who are gonna be dabbling into the law and really hurting the interest of low-income workers, but is to fund um, more legal aid like BedZedek. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And I believe with that, we will proceed to our meeting. Um, I did want to start off with a brief just overview of what we're talking about today. So hopefully, um, Everyone can see my screen. I'm just going to go over what exactly the California Justice Gap had to say about the employment um, practice area. This was, of course, one of the top three um, civil legal needs uh, identified for all Californians, regardless of income. And you can see here on this screen, kind of in a paragraph format, the types of questions that were asked in the Justice Gap study. You'll see here them laid out in a bulleted format with asterisks next to the top three reported problems within the broader employment law category. So unsafe working conditions, unfair termination, and workplace grievances not being adequately addressed. There is some potential overlap with work or decisions that have been made or put forward to the paraprofessional working group. I'm, I'm sorry, Leah, could you go back to that slide once more? I'm, I'm trying to jot down all those issues. It would be such a help if we got these materials in advance of these meetings. Okay, so wait, I, you can jot them down, but also we can come back to this slide, uh, Carolyn, for the discussion. Leah, while we're on this slide, the, the phrase wage theft is rather loaded. Could we just call that wage and hour disputes? Sure. I'm Let not able to, I'm not able to edit this while I'm uh, I, I understand. I'm just saying going forward. Okay. Carolyn, it's Erica. What I do sometimes is I'll take I'll take a picture of it on my phone. That way I don't feel like I have to write so fast, but I can still capture it so I can look at it as we I, talk. I, I don't want my phone to be discoverable under Badgley Keen. <laughs> Mm, okay. Okay. Can we move on and we can come back to this slide. So a potential overlap with other uh, decisions um, or recommendations by other working groups, the um, representation of creditors, so employees in enforcement of judgment proceedings for wage and hour claims, that was a recommendation coming out of general civil. And of course, um, an income maintenance a recommendation that paraprofessionals be allowed to uh, represent uh, parties at the administrative hearing level. 
terms of the practice analysis, so you'll all recall that last year, the State Bar conducted the job analysis that ultimately should help inform changes to the bar exam. Employment law was specifically covered in the practice analysis. So we just provide um, this data so you can get a sense of what the job analysis said about employment law. Now, these are the subcategories that were covered uh, specifically by that job analysis. So there is some crossover, um, not total crossover with what you saw from the justice gap study. Here, I've, I've shared this um, data with you all before, but just as a reminder, the first column that says, I, the first column that says ESM frequency, it's basically the frequency with which the topic was um, worked on by respondents during the job analysis survey. So here you can see employment loss fairly high up, one, two, three, four, five, six. Number six um, coming up here in terms of the frequency, it's actually, um, these are organized actually based on composite score. So it's even higher than number six on frequency. And I can tell you that this was a really interesting finding uh, when we were having the meetings around the job analysis study. Uh, this is a place where California seems to be unique. Um, and certainly there were a lot of discussions about whether or not employment law itself should be tested on the bar exam. So that's the first, um, that's the first column. The second is the criticality score. So in addition to just say, reporting what they were doing, attorneys who were performing employment related or any of these tasks during the survey were asked to say how critical they thought the work they were doing was. What would the impact be, for example, of getting it wrong? So that's the criticality score. And the composite is over here in the far right, frequency and criticality. And there you can see employment law falls fairly high in terms of that composite frequency and criticality score. Um, certainly as compared to, you see secured transactions or securities down here at the bottom. Um, so that's one aspect of the job analysis. The other depth of knowledge required. So survey respondents are also asked to determine how deep does your knowledge need to be um, when performing in these various legal areas. And you can see employment law uh, fairly high up, third from the top. Now the overall range is, is not uh, wide, it's not vast here, but employment law is up there. Um, number three, you're tied with evidence for, for third position. So that's just some of the background data that you know, we wanted to provide. And with that, I think it makes sense to go back to this slide. This is the list of potential categories that would be included. Um, and as I mentioned, there is some overlap. We call rename wage theft to wage an hour. I, wait, Linda, again, I, we got to have a chance to talk about these things. On the Department of Industrial Labor website, it says specifically wage theft. So if we're going to talk about it, let's use the term that the department includes. I, I just, I know it sounds like a little thing, but I really, you know, when we started this process off and we put things in a yes column and there was no discussion about it, you know, from the day one, um, I wanted to have input on things and I've been told I can't. So I would generally oppose change in the name of that. That's what it's called in the justice gap study. That's what it's called in the California Department of Labor website. It's wage theft. I was responding to Stephen's um, suggestion to rename it. But I, I'm just saying, here's the potential list of topics within employment. Some of them have been addressed by work of other uh, working groups. Um, the unemployment benefits has been addressed and wage theft, wage an hour, whatever we're calling it, part of that has been addressed. Um, so workers comp, I believe we addressed as part of income maintenance as well. So um, with that, I just want to turn it over to the group um, to see. I, how uh, I have two questions. Yes. Number one, what does the Justice Gap study actually show about citizens of California who have various employment claims not being able to find an attorney because the numerous public comments we just had confirm what I already believe to be the case, which is there's no shortage of attorneys out there willing to take these cases on contingency, particularly given 
that most of them have um, statutory recovery of fees. And number two, the state bar just, I'm sorry, the California Supreme Court just reduced the bar passage rate which as I understand means we're gonna have 12 to 1400 additional attorneys licensed in California every year, which seems to me to impact the answer to number one, meaning it's going to close whatever justice gap there is. So I don't have the specific, I mean, I have the, the fact that this was a top three legal need for Californians across the income spectrum. I have the fact that 85% of civil legal needs for Californians of all income levels go unmet. Um, aside from that, I don't have uh, more specific data on employment at this time. We can certainly um, provide that for a subsequent meeting. I will say, um, you know, some of this came up when we were looking at employment related issues and in income maintenance. Um, we did talk to you some employment related uh, folks in the, on the legal side. I, I do believe that there are some out there that think there are unmet needs, that the needs are not fully met by the market. Um, I would say that it might be appropriate for this group to hear from some attorneys that perhaps have a different view about how well the market is meeting uh, the needs of of the public, but I don't, you know, certainly for the next meeting, we can ask the uh, data crunchers to dig into employment more specifically. Well, I, I can address some of those questions really quickly for Steve. And, and it's basically looking at the justice gap study summary, and there are three different versions of the justice gap study, but over 65% of Californians get legal help for these needs. Um, so, I mean, that's just popped up, you know, right in the one of the beginning pages. It also, when it says, um, you know, it says the top three le um, legal needs, again, it, it's a minority, majority in terms of like the things that people need to have. Also, these figures are, you know, we've been talking about the California Justice Gap Study, but there's a 2017 Justice Gap Study that was done by the Legal Services Corporation. I think that bears studying. Employment doesn't even register on that survey at all. And so I think, um, you know, I, I really want to raise questions. And for, I have problems with all these areas, every single one of them here today on employment. And um, I'd be willing to go through them in detail. Some of these are very federal, federal issues. Some of them, as somebody noted, already have the ability to have help um, in, the, in the system. Some of them are labor laws, which are federal. Some of them deal with, um, you know, um, purely federal, disability is purely federal. So, you know, I think we have a confluence of, of problems here in this particular area with the justice gap study. It bears going into very deeply, um, but I see problems on the surface um, with it in this category. Um, it's third, you know, third does not mean first. And I see problems in the study. And also with the, the California practice area, I think that cuts against it. This was rated top three of the areas that people felt they had to have substantive information on um, above tax. You know, th this area was held to need substantive information and requirements more than tax, where you can actually go to H&R Block and get tax advice. So, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be real strenuous on this one and I have a lot of facts about it. And I will bring some experts and people to talk about it, sexual harassment, sexual discrimination, racial discrimination. Um, these just don't belong in our groups. I agree. Most of these on this list, I'd be willing to vote right now to get rid of. Erica, are plaintiffs showing up representing themselves on PAGA claims? Uh, you know, I have, I've been on the bench for almost 19 years. A lot of it was in civil. I did five years of civil trial, but that was a long time ago now. Um, so it was probably like four years ago. So I can't really, I don't feel that I have the information that is required to make a good decision. Um, but right. I, I'm sorry, Steve, uh, but I think we can find people. And I, I agree with you. There are some items here that probably you and I know, since we were doing this earlier, uh, you and I know that we both think maybe shouldn't necessarily be making it through the funnel. At this I mean, stage. I can't imagine talking to judges in LA Superior Court who would say, I don't think there's enough access to justice on PAGA claims. 
I, I just, I cannot imagine any judge saying that. But, I, I think most of them would say the opposite. But remember, we, uh, were you in the same group that we had um, the judge from Trinity, the judge yes. from LA? Yes, you were, right? So yeah. remember, there was a wide swing throughout the state regarding what is uh, available for citizens in the state, depending on where they live and the, um, whether I, it's a populous area or not. I, I, I understand small counties have different issues. I, we're, we are a very diverse state in, in every imaginable way. I get that. Well, so I'm sorry, Steve, I can't really answer your question right now about the pocket claims and self representation. Can, can I, in the interest of time, which is limited, could I suggest another straw poll to eliminate stuff? There's only three of us this time. It should be easier. I'm the only pause I have is whether the fourth person, which, whom I believe is Ira, is going to want us to revisit things because he wasn't part of this. But you know, I'm I partic I participate in straw polls. I just don't know if that's what we should do about that. It's. So, um, so for wage theft, because the, the decision by income maintenance, the recommendation was to um, recommend paraprofessionals at the administrative level, so that's before the Department of Labor, and then general civil to recommend that the paraprofessional could support enforcement of the wage and hour judgment. Um, taking what would you be taking a straw poll vote on anything else associated with wage theft or revisiting those recommendations by other uh, working groups i interpret wage theft to include far more beyond that including a whole range of wage and hour disputes which generally fall under the private attorney general act paga and so if the vote is to leave wage theft to what has already been decided and eliminate everything else, I'm okay with that because the stuff I'm worried about and I think the stuff Carolyn's worried about has not been approved. Well, but, can, oh, sorry, Steve, can you give me an example? Cause I'm sort of thinking we should leave it where we were, but I just wanna make sure I understand what you mean when you say um, po possible PAGA claims. I, there are tons of lawsuits. It's a huge part of the Superior Court docket that are wage and hour claims brought by employees saying my wage statement is wrong. I needed time, additional time off that I wasn't paid for. Oh. The California Supreme Court deals with these cases all the time. There was a major class action involving Apple where Apple check their employees on the way out to make sure they weren't stealing goods. And the Supreme Court said, you have to pay them for that. Th this is a huge, huge inventory of cases in Superior Courts and the Court of Appeal. And our program should have nothing whatsoever to do with that. Can I ask, so the, and I'm sorry, Leah, we're consuming time that we shouldn't be doing on this, but I listened to everybody who was speaking, but I, I turned off my video because I was eating fruit and it was getting sloppy. Um, for it, I know that they, a lot of this is done on a contingency fee basis. Is it conceivable that there's a, a single small individual who would have such a claim and there would not be a way for that person to have any representation? But let me address that, Your, um, Your Honor. Go ahead, Carol. The, the whole point, and maybe Steve can articulate it better than I can, but it's called the California Labor Code Private Attorney Generals Act. And yeah. the whole point of it is to take people who have small claims that wouldn't necessarily otherwise be represented and make yeah. that into a claim that then can be brought. That's the whole point of it. And so if you had a paraprofessional- Sorry, Carolyn, you're giving me, I already know some of this. And so I really just am trying to extract- The answer is no, Your Honor. No, the answer is okay. no. <laughs> They're already the, covered. The Please. very small case still entitles the plaintiff to a statutory recovery of attorney's fees. Okay. And that there, there are very 
Okay, so I'm a defense attorney. There are very entrepreneurial lawyers out there willing to take those cases. My friends who are defense attorneys complain all the time about how much they have to pay to settle incredibly small cases. Okay, so with all that being said, is there anything else that, um, Leah, do you think, or Linda, that would be encompassed in wage theft that we have not discussed? I was just going to ask Linda um, if you could, and maybe for all of these, uh, read out that is there more, a more specific question in the Justice Gap study, more specific language. Linda? Yes, I'm, I'm uh, looking for this information. So for this question, it said you had an employer who did not pay wages that were due, did not pay for earned overtime, denied benefits that were part of a work arrangement or withheld money from pay. Given what, oh, sorry, Leah, did you wanna say something? No, I think it's what, what you all have been discussing. Yes, yeah, so given what this discussion has been in my understanding and what we did in the income maintenance, I think I'm willing to say that we have funneled this out and we don't need to include this any further other than what we've already funneled through. Okay. I agree with the understanding that what's left is still subject to further process, but I agree the rest of it should come out. Yeah, we're just talking the funnel right now. It's All my, right. Yeah. I, I think I made my comments known in the income maintenance, so but we're making headway here. Right. Workers comp, I think there was, uh, where did that end up, Linda? I thought know, it, we, yeah. were, we were torn on that, and I wanted to ask Erica. Erica, you, you brought your very nice friend, Judge Padilla, who was wonderful. And then I asked her the ultimate question and she said, no, she doesn't want paraprofessionals. And then you voted yes to include them. And so I was hoping you could educate me as to why you voted yes, because I, based on that, thought it should be a no. Okay, so your question was, um, Judge, would you want someone to go to, to complain about, like when you have a, paralegal or someone doing something, wouldn't you want to have a lawyer that you could go to to complain about that person's, I guess, not, I don't want to say incompetent, but less than competent representation. And she said yes. And so for that reason, you know, you don't think that there, there should be paraprofessionals. And she basically said yes. I thought it was very masterful. You, you had, it's almost like a good cross exam. But in my view, if the state bar does decide, and it's not going to be us that decides, but if the state bar um, board decides that they are going to have paraprofessionals who go through some type of certification or training or some type of program, I think of that as equal to an attorney. If an attorney is not doing well, the judge or anybody knows they can report that person to the state bar. So same thing, if a paraprofessional isn't doing what they should do, shouldn't, couldn't we report them to the state bar if they're regulated? Right now, it, you know, there's so many people doing things that I didn't know they were doing and there's no regulation. So that's why I voted as I did because I thought, well, that in and of itself shouldn't be the one thing that keeps it out of the funnel. I'm not sure this should be at the very end when we're done with the cake, but right now, or I don't know, cause you don't funnel things into a cake, but you know what I'm saying? At the end when everything's done, I'm not sure it stays there, but what Doris said was not enough for me to say, okay, it's, it's out at the funnel point. Carolyn, you're the straw vote. I, okay, I'm totally against this being included. I am a bit, Again, I, but I have been a process person throughout this. We did throw this back into, this was part of income maintenance. Ira did have a suggestion. I, pers I, I don't wanna trump on, I think it should be out. I, I, I think I've gone through everything I've spoken about in the income maintenance group. I was kind of questioning whether we had to revisit this and if we revisit it and it gets out, I will be happy. I think the problem with this workers' compensation issue is one of health. This is health and safety. And most workers' compensation firms have very large staffs and are in place. It's, it's a very much something that you cannot do as a solo attorney 
without a considerable size staff and experienced paralegals. And like the Washington State example, a lot of these people, if we did train them, we'll just go up, end up working for attorneys and we've just given attorneys another reason not to hire a young attorney. So, so Workers' we're... comp has to do with health of people for the rest of their lives. And so we have, we have seven minutes. Can we exclude workers' comp and move on to unsafe working conditions? I, I, I see I would, Erica nodding. Okay. Thank you. Because I'm outvoted. I was, I'm was. i thinking I could change my vote, but, you know, it's two to one. So, yes, let's right. move on. Okay. Unsafe working conditions. Okay. This I, is, oh, go go ahead, ahead, Carolyn. This is straight up federal. This is labor code. This is OSHA. I mean, there's some state, there is some Cal OSHA involved. But if you got someone related and working in this, the first tier is OSHA. The first tier um, is um, this federal labor code. The same with um, workplace grievances not adequately addressed. It's it's federal. It's OSHA. I'm inclined to agree, Erica. I see you nodding in agreement. Yeah. Can we just get the question though? I want to yep. make sure there's nothing that we're not that's something that we are not considering. Question was, you were exposed to working conditions that were physically unsafe or unhealthy. I think Carolyn's answer encompassed that, Erica. Yeah. Okay, unfair termination, my strong view is, like with PAGA claims, there's a well-represented plaintiff's bar that we heard from today. Those cases get, are incredibly complex, and to me, this is an easy no. Can we just get the question? Sure, absolutely. You were terminated from a job for unfair reasons. I, I think you're. I think it should be out. I agree, Carolyn. Right out. Three nothing. Linda, what's denial of accommodations? You were denied accommodation for a disability or other medical condition necessary to perform a job. I think it should, I know that there's, you know, I handled as a judge and as a lawyer, because I did some employment defense. I handled those cases, so I know that lawyers can do it, but I just think there's, I just think that should stay in because there's, I just have a sense that that should stay in because there there might need to be some or there may be some place where paraprofessionals can assist. Because I'm my, thinking, oh, go ahead. Erica, well, for Erica and Carolyn, my understanding is denial of reasonable accommodations is sort of a prerequisite to an, to a wrongful termination case that mm -hmm. the employer did not take steps to engage in an interactive process to accommodate the worker. And so I, I don't see how you separate that out from what we just said no to. But tell me why, tell me why I'm wrong, Erica, and I'll keep an open mind. You know, I, I actually was more thinking about um, a civil suit. So you're right. If we're just talking about employment issues, that's different. And I think the reason why I'm doing that is I'm co-chairing a working group that is working on the Judicial Council ADA forms. And so when I think of accommodations, I'm thinking more of people's access to businesses and courts, but if this is solely within employment issues, I'm not thinking that, I think that you're probably right, but let me hear the question again. Sorry, Linda. No problem. Um, you were denied accommodation for a disability or other medical condition necessary to perform a job. What I'm wondering about is if there's assistance that can be provided short of a civil lawsuit. Yeah, and I would say just as an employer for many years, there are a whole host of accommodations issues that don't have anything to do with termination. Employers accommodate employees every day across the state. The problem is, the, well, yeah, but, but a certain percentage of those, the employee does not feel they are adequately accommodated and result in civil suits. So... I don't see how we draw a line between pre-litigation and litigation on this. It's just my sense is this is an underserved area. I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, the Vietnamese women who are doing nails and they're not getting accommodated because they weren't getting the masks that they needed or the gloves that they needed. They don't, there's language issues, there's fear of government issues. I'm just thinking, I don't know, there's just, I just feel strongly that we should keep this in for the funnel. 
And at this point, I feel like I could use more information and I, I would like to keep it in just to make sure that we're not doing a disservice to people. In the interest of time, I'm willing to say yes, keep it in for now, but I am, I'm broadcasting to you, Erica, that I'm skeptical this is in at the end. I totally appreciate that, and I and I have a I have a great deal of respect for you and your judgment, and also I really appreciate that you're getting that this is an important issue that I feel we need to look at some more, and so I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Steve. All right, Linda. In, in, in the interest of time, I'll say no unequivocally, and we'll bring in some people to talk about and provide more detail. Okay. And hopefully we can get a diverse group of people, which I'm so appreciative that we had today, um, representing people from various different backgrounds. I will get a defense side em employment attorney to talk about accommodations. And I, I mean like communities of color also. Okay. We'll work on that too. Thank I, you. I'll work on that too, Your Honor. I'll talk to Leanne. We'll get some balance, a balance right. group. And, and unemployment. Unemployment is... Um, you were denied unemployment benefits or unemployment benefits were stopped before they were supposed to. Okay, and my I, recollection on this is we were all okay with allow, I'm sorry, we were not all okay. Carolyn objected, but I think you and I, Erica, were okay with allowing um, paraprofessionals to assist in the administrative process and then we got hung up on Ira's issue about changing the evidence code to make them inadmissible. Carolyn, you were opposed to it. Where, where yeah. do we stand on that? Part of my problem was just the process that we went in, we went through. I was brought in at the last minute on income maintenance, and so we didn't have a lot of time to really go through it. So the report that came in, I really couldn't dig into it, and so I had to vote no. I, I tried, I tried, I tried. But where are you now? Because it's, it's you know, we're beyond all that now. Where are you? I, I think if we, this is one we're digging, again, I am inclined to vote all these things out, but if we got into some narrow technical procedural ways and then we could exclude evidence that paraprofessionals were able to dig, dig up, there are ways in which this could work. I'm dubious. Um, we need to really look at it, but if we have to keep one, this is on the bubble for me. And I was opposed to it mainly because I just, we didn't have enough time, I felt, on the wobbler. So you're a hanging Chad, like I was. I'm a, I'm a hanging Chad, but there's a lot of Chad that's hanging. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. But we've got two okay. to a hanging Chad, so I think. So at, five, at 501, let's keep unemployment benefits in. Yeah. Linda, right. what's the next one? Workplace grievances. You had a workplace grievance that was not taken seriously or adequately dealt with. Okay, that seems to me very close to denial of accommodation, but this one goes the next step by concluding that it wasn't adequately addressed, which to me is a buzzword for I employee need to sue. And so I'm inclined to keep that out. Are there any administrative proceedings that they could go to if they had such agreements? Labor disputes, I think, Your Honor, but those are handled with very, very careful and federal guidelines and contract guidance. So the word grievance to me says labor code I'm sorry, actually union labor agreements and contracts. And I don't think that's a problem. There's, you, get a, you get someone assigned to help you in agreements. I feel uninformed enough. I don't feel informed enough to really cast a well uh, thought out vote just to make a disclosure here. I think the not adequately addressed means you're past the interactive process and you are on the cusp of litigation. And that's enough for me to vote now. Yeah, I, I thought like we got at the state bar all the time, EEOC claims filed, people feeling that they were denied a promotion um, based on race or because they were being, whatever the reason is, like there's all kinds of, people have all kinds of grievances. I have a grievance because I think someone is, wears perfume, like there's all kinds of issues that are raised um, that are not like way before litigation, just. But aren't employees at the state bar, Leah, aren't they, um, some of them um, represented by a union? Some, but not all. And not all employees in the state are represented by unions. I'm gonna ask for just, um, if, if it wouldn't be terribly offensive to Carolyn and Steve, we could just keep it in so that we can have a little bit of subject matter expertise or some lawyers come to explain a little bit better so I feel more informed. I don't want to 
take too much time, but I also don't want to do violence to something that really should stay in. At 503, I'm okay with that. But I, again, I want you to understand I, you're going to have an uphill battle with me on this one. Okay, I don't even okay. know if I want to choose the battle. I just don't have enough <laughs> information. I understand. Okay. Same, same thing, Your Honor. Same thing. You're, it's up. It's up with me. I, I don't even know how to find an expert on someone with a union. But okay, let's move on. Right. Sorry. This is the Linda. last question. You were sexually harassed or subject to unfair treatment or intimidation by a supervisor or coworker. Okay. This, this to me is no, no, hell no. What does that mean? That means it should not be in the group. <laughs> I've never heard that. Um, can I just ask if Leah or Linda want to say anything? No, I just, I do think that there are a lot of power dynamics in workplaces that maybe are, um, Maybe Carolyn and, and Steve, you you aren't as familiar with, but I just imagine people that are immigrants, people that really need a job. I'm not so sure how much access they feel that they have, just because presumably there are lawyers that will take cases. The, the gap between these communities and getting a lawyer seems to me that it might be insurmountable for some communities. And one of the benefits of a paraprofessional program, I think we will find a more diverse group of people doing this work, people from the community. So that's all I would say. I mean, I don't have, I don't know the, the law. I haven't litigated these cases. I keep hearing how complex they are. Um, but I think there are a lot of power dynamics at play when people really, really need a job. And that's all I would say. In response to that, Leah, um, is that that's the problem, is that you're training someone um, who is not going to have the, the resources or the training or the understanding of exactly what's happening emotionally. And these are actually also people who are represented by lawyers in their communities. So I don't think there's a problem there necessarily. I mean, if I, as a sole attorney, try and- In the interest of time, can I just jump in? Because I think we're not gonna have much dis disagreement. I, I, I have handled some of these cases and I do think it's very complex. And I think, you know, Steve and I through previous conversations realized that we were on the same page. I just wanted to ask Leah if there was anything else because I have a great deal of respect for her. I know she's been doing this for a while and I wanna make sure we're not missing anything. But I, I think it is complex and probably is not a, a good fit for a paraprofessional. All right. So I think where we're left is uh, wage theft, wage and hour, that we don't need to discuss it further uh, in the immediate term because it's work that's already been done. Um, workers comp is, is out. Denial of accommodation. Um, so I have as, as in for further study, denial of accommodations, unemployment benefits, although that's already been vetted and workplace grievances. So really it's denial of accommodations and workplace grievances where we need to focus our learning sessions. Is that accurate? Yes. When, okay. okay, when is our next meeting? And I would like to have a defense side attorney discuss accommodations and workplace grievances. When's our next meeting, Linda? Hold on a second. Um, I think it's the 11th at five o'clock, August 11th at five o'clock. I see one on the fifth. Did we not get notice out for that? Oh, you're right. I do see one on the fifth at noon. You're right. I missed that one. That's next week. That's probably too soon to get people, but maybe not. I'll have some people. Well, I know, look, I know three people. I'm gonna call them in order until I get a yes for- And it's August hard to say no to you, but people from communities of color yeah, I, I people, will, people who, I, from representing people who are poor, <laughs> who don't have access. That would be really meaningful to me. Okay, but Erica, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get someone from the defense bar who's not representing that oh. community, who's representing businesses, so we get a balanced discussion. But I'm hoping Carolyn or staff. Yes, yes I, I can certainly do that. We'll, we'll work on it. Yeah. yeah. 
Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Good work. Yeah, I know. We got a lot done. Happy hour. Hopefully, Ira won't be upset with us. <laughs> All right. I, I think Ira, at the end of the day, would have voted with most of these. Okay. All okay. right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 B